Um, <clears throat> I will begin by talking about uh, several different questions concerning uh, disagreement and the epistemology of disagreement. And uh, along the way, we'll, we'll say some things about how those connect questions interact with one another. I want to talk a little bit about a general approach to epistemology, my own, my own uh, view of things, evidentialism, and think about how that influences, uh, or what implications that has for questions about disagreement. And then uh, the last part of the talk will be about um, this idea that uh, evidence of evidence, that is evidence about evidence, what, what implications that has for questions of rationality. And I'll explain what I mean by that as we get to it. So let's begin with, um, with a distinction, with the, with the questions that uh, uh, I think are provoked, some of the key questions that are provoked in the discussions of the epistemology about disagreement. Uh, the first question is, is the one, uh, Q1 on the handout, can people involved in peer disagreements reasonably disagree? And what I mean by that is this, when people are involved in a discussion of something, pe people who are reasonably close to one another, their peers, they're, they're somewhat similar at least in, uh, in, in uh, knowledge, background knowledge, uh, evidence, reasoning abilities, intelligence, and the like, can it be that they come to different conclusions and they're both reasonable? In, in maintaining those, those differing conclusions in the face of uh, disagreement with one another. Can, can reasonable disagreement persist? So I'm thinking at a, you know, there's, there's various kinds of examples. There's the dinner party where there's a conversation about something and people are trying to reason about some topic. They come to different conclusions. Can it be that both sides to the dispute are, are reasonable at the end after they've heard one another? Uh, I spend a fair amount of my time at administrative meetings and people argue about things and it's the same kind of thing. Can, can it be that uh, the dis differing people, the different sides are reasonable after, after that discussion? And a philosophy conference is another nice example of that kind of thing. We, we, we discuss some topic, we know much of the same information about it, we come to different conclusions. Can it be that we're reasonable in maintaining our various points of view? Um, so, so that's that's one question. A second kind of question that might seem very closely connected, but I'm going to say that there's at least a room for some difference uh, between the first and the second, uh, or that the connections aren't quite as close as at least I thought they were initially. How should one respond to finding out that a peer disagrees? That is, it's one thing, it's, it's, suppose I have my point of view, I come into a discussion with you, you're a peer, you differ, what should I do then? How should, how, if at all, should I change my attitude in response to your, to, to what I learned from you? And then there's a, a third question, this is Q3 on the handout, what should a participant in a peer disagreement think about the rationality of a peer? That is, what, what can I think about you who disagrees with me? Can, can I think you're reasonable too? Or do I have to think if you're disagreeing with me and we're similar in the ways we've described, do I have to think that you are unreasonable for not seeing things my way or that I'm unreasonable for seeing things as I do or whatever? But can I, what, can I, what should one think about uh, what the peers are and the attitudes of the peers and, and one of the one of the ideas will be that although these questions are pretty closely connected not quite as closely connected as I thought or at least as one might think that is that there's room for some some uh, gaps between what you say about one and, and what you might say about the other that, that um, the answers don't follow as, as evidently as quickly as you might have thought so that, that's the first main, the first topic that I, that I will uh, wanted to introduce. The second, I want to, I want to take a, just a few minutes to describe the, the perspective toward epistemology, the evidentialist view that I, I hold. And I'm not arguing for this here, I'm just going to describe it, and that will sort of be the framework in which I'm thinking about things. And there are lots and lots of details about this that don't matter at all 
here. I, and I, whether, whether what I'm about to say is controversial or not, well, I'm sure it is, but, but uh, some of it, I think, is, is not in any case. So, so the evidentialist idea is, is very simple. It's that rash, rationality or justification of belief depends entirely upon evidence. That is, what you're justified in believing, what you're rational in believing, is completely a function of the evidence you have. Put another way, you should always follow your evidence. Uh, you should believe in accordance with the evidence that you have. Um, that, that may seem like a platitude. That's okay by me. Um, let me state it more precisely and say a little bit about what's contentious about it. So this is on the handout as, as EVI, uh, so a more precise statement of the evidentialist idea as I'm thinking about it. There's variants of this that we could discuss. An attitude, doxastic attitude, that is belief, disbelief with suspension of judgment, is justified for a person if and only if that's the attitude that fits the person's evidence. So when one's evidence is counterbalanced, evenly matched, pro and con, suspension of judgment is the justified attitude. When the evidence better supports a proposition than its denial, belief is the justified attitude. And when it's the denial that's better supported by the evidence, disbelief is the justified attitude. You could replace this by a thing of principle in terms of degrees of belief, where there's more than just believing, disbelieving, and suspending judgment. And I don't know that for anything much turned, in today's talk, turns on, on that. Evidentialism does, as formulated here, imply that rationality is not determined by how good an inquirer you've been, whether you've gone about gaining evidence in a, in a responsible or effective way. It just says what you're justified in believing depends on the evidence that you do have, however you came to have it, whatever you've done about it, whatever information there might be that is sort of out there that you don't know about. If it's not part of your evidence, it doesn't affect the justification of your belief at the time. Uh, there's other, other assessments of people that can be made about whether they're going about gathering evidence in a good way and the like, which are just apart from this and apart from this concept of rationality. Uh, reliability has nothing directly to do, to do with this account of, of justification, uh, whether you're functioning in, in some natural way, whether you're sort of following the, the built-in cognitive mechanisms we have or not, just are separate questions. So, so evidentialism does deny some things that are prominent in contemporary epistemology, I think. As I'm thinking about it, the evidence one has is just the information you have to go on informing, informing beliefs. Um, that's largely going to be other justified beliefs that you have. The, the other thing, the other information, the other justified beliefs you have will be your evidence for further ones. But as I think about it, your experiences are part of your evidence too. So if it, the feeling of warmth might contribute to the justification of the belief that it's warm or that the, the perceptual experience you're having right now can contribute to the justification of the belief that the lights are on and, and things like that. So experiences can play a role too, at least as I think about it. A uh, couple other things about this way of thinking about evidentialism that will be useful as we proceed. Uh, as I'm thinking about it, evidential relations are this is, I put it on the handout, objective. And what I mean by that is there's just a fact about whether some body of evidence supports some conclusion or not. It's not somehow up to you. It's not that it, it's a function of some other thing about you uh, or your society or anything like that. It's just what the facts are. Whether, whether this evidence supports a conclusion or not is just a fact, kind of a quasi-logical kind of fact about, about uh, uh, the world. And as I'm thinking about it, evidential relations are necessary. That is, they don't vary from world to world or situation to situation. There's just, it, they're, they're like facts of logic in that um, they're fixed. 
Um, I don't know how much that will matter in, in today's talk, but that is how I think about things. And it, it may be influencing what I say about a few things, so I wanted to make that idea explicit. There's one thing that will be important later on that I want to illustrate uh, briefly, and that's what's uh, the next thing on the handout, E3, uh, that parts of reasons or, or parts of a body of evidence for a conclusion are typically not themselves reason or evidence for that conclusion. Here's what I mean. Here's what I mean by that. Just as if you have a, if you have a, a, a valid argument with, say, three premises, all of which are needed to support the conclusion. It's not as if two of the premises by themselves are somehow support that conclusion by themselves. It's the, it, it's the three together that do it. And similarly, the way I think about evidence, parts of a body of evidence are typically not themselves supportive of the conclusion or evidence for the conclusion, just as parts of the premises don't sort of imply the, the, the conclusion in, in an argument. And, and that matters, and, and this is important for at least how I think about things, and I grant that you don't have to think about things the way I do on this topic. That is, there's other ways to organize this sort of material. But here's a simple example. I have a colleague, uh, Joanna, who drives a, a red Toyota. She has an assigned parking place out behind our building, and uh, she works very hard. She's often in the office before I get there in the morning, and she's there when I leave at night. And so often when I arrive in the morning, I see her car in her parking spot, and I think, ah, Joanna's already in. It's already in her office. And you might say something like this, the fact that her car is in her parking spot is my evidence that she's in, in her office. Well, that's an okay way to talk, but as I think about it, not literally true, or at least not, not true in this more regimented way of thinking about it, because that fact by itself doesn't support that conclusion, that fact by itself is only contingently related to the fact that she's in her office. She could have had a different kind of car. She could have had a different kind of parking space. I'm not thinking about the contingency of the, 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 possibil the possibility that, that uh, even in, in the actual situation, somebody else with a similar car could have been in the, could park in her spot, or she could have her car there but have left it the day before and gotten a ride to the airport or something and not be there. That's all true, but that's not what I'm thinking about. It's, it's that her car being in its spot is only part of the relevant evidence I have for the conclusion that she's there. It conjoins with my background information about that's her spot, that's the kind of car she typically drives. When, she's, when her car is in that spot, she's typically in her office. All that kind of information together is what I'm thinking of as the evidence that draws that con supports that conclusion. And the piece by itself, as I see it, doesn't support the conclusion at all, right? It's, it's a part of something that does. We often, I think, casually, or even not so casually, talk, talk about a salient or significant piece of evidence as the evidence. And as I'm thinking about it, it's a part of the evidence. But the, the, the real thing that supports the conclusion is the larger, the larger story. That will, that will matter a little bit later on. So a few things about evidentialism and disagreement. Uh, and these are listed in the next little section on the handout. So I think um, to the extent that there's a general evidentialist answer to questions about what you should think upon learning about a, a peer who disagrees with you, about what you should do in response to learning of a peer disagreement, it's this, follow your evidence. That is, it's, it's what you should do is believe whatever's supported by the evidence you now have after you've found out that there's been, that there is this disagreement. So if, if um, I believe something, I encounter you, you're my peer, we think about things, we talk it through for a while, and, and you, I find out you have a different thought, 
what I should do is believe whatever whatever my evidence at that point supports. So, so I should change my beliefs largely on the basis of whatever that new evidence does to my overall situation. Um, let me, uh, this is really an aside. As I think about evidentialism, I find in this thought confirmation of evidentialism, at least versus rivals that say non-evidentialist things, like the idea that you should do whatever would be the reliable thing to do under those circumstances or something, uh, strikes me as not, not very enlightening. Surely the right thing to do is say, well, now I've learned this fact. My peer disagrees. How should I incorporate that into my thinking? That's what an evidentialist asks you to do. That seems like exactly the right, the right response. But then, then here's, here's what I think, and this is, this is uh, ED2 on the handout. I think there won't be any special principles that say whenever you encounter a peer change in this way or believe do this, it's just going to be complicated. It's going to depend on what the overall evidence then supports. And there's no, there is, as I see it, no simple answer to that. It's always going to depend upon various of the details, exactly what's, what uh, is happening, uh, exactly what your background information is, what other information you have about the situation, and the like. So I will say a little bit more about some spe uh, specific principles in, in, a, in a minute, uh, or a few minutes. But um, it might be worth just saying this first, that, that if there were any special principles about what to happen in cases, what happens in cases of disagreement, they would have to have one of two, two characteristics. Either they'd be they'd conflict with evidentialism. That is, it would say, well, here's what evidence, your evidence supports, but in cases of disagreement, you need to do this, some other thing that differs. That is, it would be a denial of evidentialism, and I wouldn't want to get into that situation. The other possibility is they'd have to be consequences of evidentialism. It would have to be that your evidence always leads to some, some outcome. And that would mean that whenever you gain evidence about a peer disagreement, it always has the same overall impact on your evidence so that some general principle, some special principle about uh, what you ought to do, say, always suspend judgment. It would have to be then that whenever you found out about a peer, no matter what the situation was, your evidence was then counterbalanced, evenly split between belief and disbelief. And I'm, I'm skeptical that, that that's how things go. It's just more complicated than that. Uh, as I say, I'll say a little bit more about that uh, as I progress. Um, one thing that this way of thinking about things does uh, to the discussion as it's evolved over the last several years is that um, I think what it does, what this helps you to avoid is a certain kind of controversy that, that some of us have gotten involved in, and that's about exactly what counts as a peer. If you're formulating special principles that say whenever you, you have a disagreement with a peer, then you ought to, and you have some conclusion, like you ought to suspend judgment or you ought to modify your belief, it's going to be very important to understand exactly what counts as a peer in order to figure out how to, how to apply that principle and see if there's counterexamples to it. And if you look at at least some of the literature, there's various ideas about what counts as a peer, sometimes very, very strong conditions. Peers are people who are exactly alike with respect to all the evidence they have on a topic, or exactly alike in their abilities to reason, or exactly alike with respect to uh, intellectual or, or epistemic uh, talents, or something like that. Um, and if that's what you think about peers, uh, well, you might be able to defend some principle or other, and if you modify the account of what a peer is, you might be able to find a counterexample to, to some proposed principle or other by, by the special, uh, by whatever you say, the, the weakened condition on what a peer is. But 
if you're not trying to formulate a special principle, then you don't have to come up with any precise definition of, of peer. Um, you can just think about it, you can think about it this way. Um, whenever you encounter a disagreement with somebody, you can think about what you ought to do in light of having discovered that that person disagrees with you about the topic. And if the person is pretty much like you, it might have one implication. If the person is less like you, it might be, if they're a lot smarter, it might have one implication. If, they're, if you think they're less informed, it might have less of an implication or be less significant. It'll just, it'll just vary. But that seems exactly the right thing to say whenever you encounter a peer, a person, well, now, who disagrees? What should I think now? I mean, that's always the question, and that's the question in that context, too. And so it's a kind of case-by-case -case evaluation. Uh, so there's no, as it says on the handout, <laughs> as if that's support, uh, there is no need to define peer precisely. It's just a matter of case-by-case -case evaluation. The question in all examples in this domain is, what should one think after interacting with this person in this setting? the characteristics of the person in question matter, but even if the person is your epistemic inferior, that still might be influential. It's not as if, you know, every time some, you know, it's, I hope, at least I wouldn't be like this, well, this person's inferior to me, hence I don't care what he thinks, you know, it makes no difference. It, it, there might be something there. It's something worth taking into account. So everybody's views matter some, and uh, we don't have to be precise about what counts as a peer. It's just how, how do we think about people. And, and so people can be near peers and proximate peers, and that's fine, but, but there's no principle that turns on that. Um, at least as I see it. I think we shouldn't worry about the absence of simple principles. I, I won't go into this here, but I don't think there are any in other domains either. I don't think there, there are any special principles that say, you know, if you read something in the New York Times, then this. I mean, no, it, it, it depends. Uh, it, it's always more complicated than that. Uh, I think pretty much the same is true about perception in other domains too. So, so the issues, the issues are, are really about cases, uh, trying to understand what happens in cases in which people who are pretty similar to one another and have pretty similar bodies of evidence come to different conclusions. And that's the realistic case. That's the situation that you're in when you're at a dinner table conversation with somebody who's, who's a friend, a colleague, pretty much like you, comes to a different conclusion, has pretty much the same information, and the question is, what should you do when you discover that you're in a situation like that? What's the reasonable thing to do? And the unfortunate answer to my, as I, well, I don't know if it's unfortunate, but the true answer, I think, is, well, it depends. Sometimes you should pretty well stick to your guns, maintain your belief. Sometimes the reasonable thing to do will be to modify in light of that, and it's all going to depend on details. I think there's no, no simple, simple answer. And, and uh, the, the, one of the questions, one of the issues uh, underlying all of this is um, going to be about whether reasonable disagreement between people like that, that is similar people with similar bodies of evidence is, is possible. And that's a wishy-washy enough question, indefinite enough question. The answer is almost surely yes. I mean, if it's similar, the difference might be enough to allow for that. But, uh, but uh, in any case, um, uh, that's what I think is the, is the fundamental issue. Uh, and finally, what this, in this section, finally, what this brings out, at least as I see it, is that the key question is, what kind of evidence do you actually obtain in these sorts of cases of, in, of interaction with p disagreeing peers? Uh, what, what is the new evidence? And if we identify what that evidence is, then we can more readily try to understand what sort of impact it might have on your epistemic situation. 
And this is uh, uh, at the bottom of the first page of the handout. As I see it, the, the kinds of evidence obtained is um, of two sorts. Sometimes in these discussions, you get ordinary first order evidence about the subject matter. The person just gives you facts bearing on the situation that you didn't know about, just data. But the, what, to my mind, the, what's especially interesting, especially puzzling and striking about the kinds of uh, cases brought out in the literature on epistemic disagreement is you often get um, evidence about what the peer thinks on the subject or about the significance of the shared evidence. That is, we agree, here's the evidence, and we differ about what that supports, what, what significance it has. What, what influence it has. So we agree, here are some of the facts, and you say, well, that supports P, and I say, no, it doesn't, that supports not P, and Q. You know, so, so we share much of the facts, and we differ about what it supports. Um, or sometimes what happens out of these cases is you get the idea there's something this person has on the topic, some information that I'm not sure just what it is, or I, I don't have that exact information myself, but he must have something that's leading him or her to that conclusion, and, and the issue is what to make of that. So all that kind of stuff is what I call evidence of evidence, that it's sort of evidence about the evidence. It's not just the first order evidence, it's not just the facts but it's also information about what the other person makes of the facts of the, or what other information the person has or that the person has some evidence that you don't know about. So I'm calling all of that sort of thing evidence of evidence and what I want to spend much of the rest of the time on is thinking about um, what to, how to understand that idea and what we can make of it. Okay. Um, let me spend a little while on the connections between the questions one, two, and three with which I started and then uh, turn to the evidence of evidence is evidence principle. I'll be brief about the connections between the questions. Question three, what should a participant in a peer disagreement think about the rationality of the peer? Um, the, the main thing I want to say about that is um, I want to back off on something that I, that I had previously thought was true on this and, and assert something a little bit different. Um, and maybe that's to say I differ with a past self of, my, of mine, which maybe that's another peer, but, uh, and that might be a little bit of trouble for me. Um, but, but it's this. Um, so I used to think, well, you, you, can't, you can't think something like this. We've got this shared evidence. I think it supports P. That's a reasonable thing to do and reasonable for me to believe P but you think it supports not P, and that's a reasonable thing for you to think, and sort of we're both okay. I used to think that can't be right. But that seems to me to be a little too quick, because there's a, a, a complication is that it depends on what I reasonably think about the nature of rationality. If, if say, I've been unduly influenced or say a person has been unduly influenced, and unduly here is unfair, if a person has been influenced by, and justifiably so, by someone who thinks that, um, has a very different view about the nature of rationality, say you're rational if you're being sincere, something like that, well then I might think, I might justifiably think that you can have multiple justified attitudes based on the same evidence. And so, Right. I hope that was clear. So it's, it's what you justifiably think about rationality will play a role in what you can justifiably think about, about what the peers can think in your situation. So I think any view that builds in the idea that you have to think something about, about the rationality of a disagreeing peer must presuppose or must depend upon some attitudes about the nature of rationality or justification. But if you think you can have, one can justifiably have, say, more permissive attitudes about rationality, 
then you can have more permissive attitudes about what's justified in these situations. So, so the, 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 the beliefs about rationality or justification about rationality uh, play a major role here. Um, I'm just looking at the time and seeing. Uh, well, yeah, but I have a long way to go. <laughs> uh, um, okay. Uh, a few words about the connections between questions one and questions two, about how you should rationally respond to disagreement and can people in peer disagreements reasonably disagree. And the main thing I want to I want to say here is this: um, consider a principle like the one on the handout. This is on the second side of it. Uh, it's labeled S T Y G. That's stick to your guns. Um, that's that's the idea that in the light of disagreement, you should just keep believing. Um, what you, what you did before. So if you believe something, you learn that your peer disagrees, then you should continue to believe as you did. Not, not be changed. Um, and uh, I think as a general view, this is naive and simplistic, but, but uh, what I want to talk about, what I want to think about briefly is this argument. Suppose you think that's true. That might easily get you to the conclusion that there can be reasonable disagreements. That is, the answer to question one is, is yes, because if there's two people, they're in a dispute like that, they each should stick to their belief, then, then they can reasonably disagree. So you might think there's a pretty close connection. And, and then here's, here's why I want to, where I, I am now worried about that kind of argument. Um, question, question one is a question about the rationality of believing a proposition. Question two is a proposition about how, how to change beliefs in response to new evidence uh, or new information. And those are those are different kinds of questions, and, and at least as I'm now, as I see it. And take an example: a person who has a wholly, a wholly unjustified belief in his competence in some domain, say predicting the outcome of games of chance. He learns something completely irrelevant. Today is Thursday, and you ask yourself this question. What should he do with respect to this belief in his confidence, his competence, in light of learning that today is Thursday? And you might think nothing, because he hasn't learned anything relevant to it. Nothing, nothing new has happened. So, so. If, if you think, so, so here's the thing, and I want to be very con much conditional about this. I don't know what the right thing is, but the right idea is. But, but here's, here's the, the point. Um, if, you, if you think as I'm tempted, well, if you think as, as some might, that you should only change beliefs, you should only modify your belief in light of learning something new that's relevant to it, then you might think that if a person has an unjustified belief and learns something irrelevant to it, the right thing for the person to do is to maintain that unjustified belief. Right? That was the idea. That was the example. I have some unjustified belief. I learned something that has nothing to do with it. I should stick with it rather than modify it in light of learning that irrelevant thing. So if you think that, if, if you think that, then then questions one and two come apart in a certain way because, because it might be that in, the, in, the, in light of disagreement, people don't learn things, uh, that they don't have to change their beliefs in light of pure disagreement. That depends upon the evidential significance of that disagreement. But it doesn't follow... If, if you think learning a peer disagreement isn't evidentially significant, you might think they shouldn't change. That doesn't imply that they are both reasonable, 
they're both reasonable in believing as they do because the straight out of valuation of their belief not how should they change but what's the status of their belief is 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 just a different different question so i think i think those those things complicate the connections between the different questions okay i'm going to skip the rest of that section and turn to evidence of evidence So, in, in an earlier paper on this topic, I, I said, thinking about the, the, the same kind of idea, I said, evidence of evidence is evidence. And that was a very cute slogan, and I really liked it, because I liked saying the word evidence three times in one five-word sentence, and, and saying something that I thought was true and significant. Uh, that, I really got a great kick out of that. Um, but I've come to see that it's actually confusing and, and it, it requires unpacking and that's what I wanna take the remaining time to try to understand and defend, defend a clearer idea here. So, um, why why is it why is it confusing well here's here's a way to make it confusing um, <clears throat> and one of my students uh, graduate students Brian Barnett uh, made this made me really see this there's a reading of the slogan evidence of evidence is evidence that makes it completely trivial trivial evidence of put anything in the middle place there is evidence, right? E evidence, right? evidence of anything is evidence, of course, right? I, th that's, that's just a triviality. Um, that is evidence that something is evidence is evidence. Well, of course, right? Evidence that something is anything is evidence. So, so that, that can't be the idea. Well, not, not if the idea is of any interest anyway. That's not it. Um, so look at EE2 on the handout. Evidence of evidence for P is evidence for P. That's a little closer to what, what I think I was trying to say, but that can't be quite right either, at least not on a certain reading of what, what uh, 2 says. That is evidence that something is evidence for P. Is it, is, if the principle says evidence that something is evidence for P is evidence for P. Um, that is, I call that EE3. That's a reading of this one. If E1 is evidence that E2 supports P, then E1 supports P. No. Right? That says if I learn, if I get evidence, that, that something supports something else, I therefore get support for that final conclusion. No, if my colleague Earl Connie tells me that a certain kind of inductive information is evidence for some conclusion, that tells me something about the logical relationship between that evidence and that conclusion. It doesn't give me any evidence for that conclusion, it just gives me evidence about the logic or about the epistemic relation. It's not evidence in its own right. Um, so the, the evidence of evidence as evidence principle can't have been <laughs> at least again, on the assumption that it was a good idea, it, it can't be um, evidence about the existence of some abstract evidential relationship between propositions. It had to be more about the actual existence of some evidence or somebody's having some evidence or something like that. So um, if a person has E1 as evidence and E1 supports the proposition that E2 supports P, then S has evidence E, namely E1 that supports P. No, that, that's the fourth thing on the list. That, that won't do it either. Um, so the, the better one is, that just got you that, that the person had, somebody had the evidence that there was this supporting relationship. So maybe the idea is this, and it's, it's I think, equivalently captured in, in, in ideas EE5 e, and 6 on the handout. Let's just look at six. I think that's the easier one to think about. If, if E1 supports the proposition that E2 supports P, 
then the conjunction of E1 and E2 supports P. Um, so if I have evidence that something else is, supports a conclusion, then the combination of that thing that what I what I, that first piece of evidence and the fact that the second supports the other, those two together support the conclusion. Um, that's better, but that's not quite right either. Um, and and I think rather than go through an objection directly to that, I want to. It'll be helpful to look at at one more because the same kind of point will support support both. So here's a way of putting something similar. Uh, let's call this E. This is E seven on the handout. I know I'm going through these things pretty quickly, but but I, I hope you'll see the idea. Um, if if some evidence E supports the proposition that there's someone else who has evidence supporting P, then E supports P. I hope you see that's, that's sort of the same kind of, I, that's the same kind of idea. So if I have evidence, and this is what I was thinking initially, if I have evidence that you have evidence for P, then I have evidence for P. Evidence that you have evidence for P gives me evidence for P, right? That is, if I if, if you have a reason, if I if I have reason to think you have a reason to think P, then I have a reason to think P. Out of the fact that I know you have one, or I have reason to think you have one, that gives me a reason. So that I think is closer to what I was thinking. And and stated precisely in the way it is in E seven, it's not right. Something can support a proposition, but well, well the counterexample to it is very simple. Brandon Fiddleson uh, made me see this uh, very clearly. Um, something can support a conjunction like this. I could have evidence for a conjunction like you have evidence. For the false prop, I, I, for the false proposition P. Right? I can, I could have, I could have something could support that. You have evidence for the false proposition P. Consider the evidence, evidence like that. That gives me that that supports the proposition that you have evidence supporting P. But that certainly doesn't support P. It supports not P. Right? It supports that P is false, right? You got it? You have, so suppose you, the, easy, the easiest one is this. Suppose here's, here's the thing you learn. Suppose you read in, in today's paper, you didn't read yesterday's paper, and you read in today's newspaper, yesterday's paper contained the following error. You now have reason to think a lot of people who read yesterday's newspaper had evidence supporting a conclusion. But that evidence, the, the, the error report in today's paper doesn't support that conclusion. Right, the thing erroneously reported. That's a counterexample to EE7, and I think it's a counterexample to the, to the ones before, too. So EE8, though, I think is right. And I'll, so I'll, I'll say this, and then I'll take my last five minutes to defend EE8 from what people might think will be obvious objections. So if S has evidence E1 supporting the proposition that there's someone who has evidence that supports P, then S has evidence E2 that supports P. I think that's true. <laughs> I see some looks of surprise out there, uh, but, but I do think that's true, and that's that's what I want to defend and explain in my last five minutes, maybe. the The supporting evidence you have might be a, a carefully regimented, selected part 
of the, the uh, initial evidence. That is, E2 might be a part of E1, and it might have to be, in some cases, a carefully selected part or, or uh, a piece of evidence you get out of E1. So to use the newspaper example that I just gave, in, in that case where you read today's error report, you then learn yesterday's paper reported whatever it was. So yesterday's paper re erroneously reported the score of some, some athletic event. It, got, it reversed its scores for the teams. You learn that yesterday's paper reported that. That's a piece of evidence you now have supporting a conclusion that the score was as originally reported. So, so, so that's what I think happens there. I'll go through another example like that in a minute. I think I, the reason I go through all of this is I think that in virtually every case of disagreement, you get evidence that at least this, that there's a peer who, who thinks as he does and, that's all, and has evidence of this sort. So you always get some kind of evidence like this against your conclusion. Because every time, it's, I don't mean to say it's exactly like in this case about errors and all that. It's just in every case of disagreement, you get the fact that this person who I respect, who is approximate like my peer, thinks as he or she does, that's always testimonial evidence against your conclusion. It's always, you always get that kind of evidence. And so in every case of disagreement, you get some evidence supporting the denial of what you initially believe. In every case of peer disagreement, you get some evidence against what you believe, you initially believe. And I think this way of thinking about things helps us see, helps us understand what diff when, when you think about it that way, and then you see how, how, these, how that fact can add in, how that can, can factor in, you'll see various kinds of differences among cases. So David Christensen has a much discussed case about you and your, your friend at a restaurant add up the bill and, and figure out the shares and come to different conclusions. I, and that's a striking case. And what's interesting about it is there, I think, you didn't already know you know, people think it's a different number than the one you thought, a different amount, and so you, you, that's, a, that's a really significant fact that there's disagreement. If I'm at a dinner party and I find out one of my friends disagrees with me about, say, what in the U.S. we ought to be doing with health care policy, well, that might be new fact that this person disagrees, but I already know there's a whole lot of disagreement about that and that this per particular person thinks as he does is typically not such a big deal. And so the significance of these facts, how, much, how they weigh in, can, can really vary. Okay, so, so um, background information can really affect the impact that learning this thing will have. Uh, to end with a couple of, of kinds of puzzling cases or consequences of this. Um, so am I saying, you might ask, consider the proposition that the lights are on. I believe it. And now I could go around the room and ask each person, do you think the lights are on? And I presumably each of you still awake would say, yes. And Am I saying, with each additional bit of testimony, I get more evidence that the lights are on? Yes. And if there's a stack of newspapers, and I go through them and read each copy of the same paper, and each one has the same headline, do I get more and more evidence for that conclusion? Yeah. I think I do. That is, I learn another fact that supports that conclusion. That is the logical relation, be, you know, given the background information that you say it, that you say it, that you say it, each of that supports that conclusion. Yes. But that leads me to think that maybe we have to worry about this additivity of evidence principle that I have listed here. Do I get more and more justified? 
in believing that the lights are on as I go around the room, or does it peter out after, after a while? Does it just cease to make any difference? Now, some people will insist that I, get, I ever get ever so infinitesimally, yeah, even does, infinitesimally more justified in thinking the lights are on as, as, um, as uh, I ask more and more people, but in other, in other attitude might be, and what I'm inclined to favor, although I don't have any particularly powerful argument for, I don't, not even powerful, I don't have an argument for this, um, is, is that it doesn't, um, it doesn't add to make me more, it's, it's evidence, but it doesn't make me more justified. It doesn't add up in, in that way. Uh, one other fact is the fact that I believe that the lights are on count as with, background evidence com count as support the conclusion that the lights are on or whatever. Yes, I think it does. Can I keep saying that to myself over and over again and jack up my justification? No, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't keep adding. Um, a different kind of case. Um, back to that newspaper case. Uh, very briefly, and then I will stop. Yesterday, uh, suppose I read in the, today's paper an article that says, yesterday the newspaper erroneously reported that P, we regret the error. That's what it says. My view implies, with a little bit of background information, that I just got evidence that P, the thing that was erroneously reported. Is that true? Yes, I think it is. I got evidence that's defeated. For me. That is, I got evidence that's undermined by other evidence I got at the same time. So I learned one fact. Yesterday the paper reported that P, which supports P, or with background information given what I said at the outset. I learned one thing. Yesterday the paper reported that P, which together with background evidence supports the conclusion that P, and at that very same time I learned that that was an error. I got evidence that that was an erroneous report, and that undermines the conclusion. And so I didn't get more justified in believing P as a result of reading that, but I did get some evidence that supports that conclusion. Namely, I learned that it was reported in yesterday's paper. That's summed up in the principle DE. That's the last item at the, on the handout. Defeated evidence is evidence. That is, if, if I learn something and with it, I learned something that undermines it. That's defeated evidence. And, and my, the idea I have here is that defeated evidence is nevertheless evidence. That is, defeated evidence that supports a proposition is nevertheless evidence that supports that proposition, even if the way it figures in how I ought to believe things as a result is it, it ought not change it at all. That is because of the overall evidence I got. But the regimented part, the segmented part that's supportive is supportive. That's, this is where some of the ideas at the very beginning about evidential relations matter, that they're necessary and all. Well, if, if, if yesterday's, the report yesterday supported the conclusion, if the proposition that yesterday's paper reported P sort of in its own right supported the conclusion that P, well, it still does even if it comes with it comes in the context of learning something different. So, so defeated evidence is evidence. Um, okay, all of that stuff about how evidence works can help you see um, how what we learn in cases of disagreement is often this evidence about evidence, about the existence of evidence, about what others have, how others see it. And then whether that comes as, as defeated evidence or not, as partly or undermined evidence or not, all of that can affect what impact it's going to have on what you ought to do in light of disagreement. So sometimes learning that kind of thing, learning about evidence will carry with it Will have a significant impact, and you really ought to change your mind as a result or weaken your belief. So I, I still believe that what we learn in disagreement is often uh, undermining to a certain extent. I maintain a kind of conciliatory view that says in disagreement you do learn something that's evidence against what you initially believe, 
what impact that's going to have depends on the larger picture. And that was what all this sort of rigmarole at the end was supposed to illustrate. Sometimes you might learn that a peer disagrees, and it could be like the, like the, like the erroneous report in the newspaper. It might be it shouldn't change your belief at all. It might be sometimes it really should have a, a, a significant impact. And, and it all depends on details. There's no simple principles about all of that. I've gone too long, so I will stop there. Thank you.